Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this Just Economy session. Um, well, I'm going to turn it over very uh, quickly over to um, our wonderful moderator and panelists. Um, but just wanted to um, yeah, say thank you for, for joining us for this conversation on guaranteed income. Um, for those of us who don't know us, uh, NCRC is a, a national organization uh, working with uh, community, uh, communities across the country uh, to increase opportunities to build wealth. Um, so many of you already are working with us in a variety of ways to do that work. Um, just want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping notes. To make sure that everyone can hear, participant lines are muted, but feel free to interact in the chat. Um, we have a code of conduct, which applies to all NCRC events, including this session. You can check it out at ncrc.org backslash code. Um, and we will be holding most questions until the end, but feel free to go ahead and submit them as they come to you through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we also um, are, uh, you can um, tweet about this or post on social media, tag um, NCRC, um, and yeah, look forward to seeing that engagement as well. Um, so, Helene, I will uh, turn it over to you um, to introduce our panelists. Hi, everybody. I'm Helene Olin of the Washington Post and the New Schools Public Seminar. And I am here to moderate this terrific panel introducing all of us to the concept of um, guaranteed um, income for people who need, need it. Um, you, but you came here not to hear from me, but from our panelists. So I am going to just do a very quick introduction. Um, and I'm doing it in the order I'm seeing people on my screen, which might not be the order you're seeing them on your screen. Um, on my right, to my left, I have uh, Mayor Michael Tubbs of Stockton. Um, and below me, I have Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway of Madison. Next to her, I have uh, Madeline Naley of Economic Security Pro Project, right? I've got that right. And um, joining us in a few moments because um, they're running late is uh, the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, Shokwe Lumumba. So I'm just going to get started here and I'm gonna throw out my first question, which is, is both, both the terms guaranteed income and universal basic income get used a lot and often interchangeably. They're not interchangeable and everybody has a slightly different uh, definition of both of them. So if each one of you want to sort of say what you think guaranteed income is and why we need it, um, or we don't need it, if that's your opinion, but I don't think it is. Um, and whoever wants to start first, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna ask Mayor Tubbs to start first in that case, since he's to my left and I can see him the most easily on my screen. Well, thank you so much for having me and um, apologies in advance. I had a dental appointment at nine. I had, that was a cleaning. It actually was some cavity work. So I'm a little bit swollen on my right side. So if I'm not clear or my mouth was a bit funny, um, that's why. In terms of the difference between a basic income and a guaranteed income, I think a universal basic income speaks to everyone getting unconditional cash reoccurring and ongoing. And a guaranteed income says, while universality may be the goal, let's guarantee that those who absolutely need it get it, right? So uh, what we see right now in the halls of Congress, guaranteed income bills for American families making $125,000 or less. And I think politically in this country, that's possibly the most feasible way to get to an economic floor that provides security um, for all Americans. I Mayor, Rose yeah. oh. Mayor Rose Conway? I would, I would agree with Mayor Tubbs and, and um, let me also say thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here and to talk about this. Um, you know, I, I do think that that, you know, that income floor, right, that making sure that everybody is taken care of in one way or another um, is really, you know, what draws me to the idea of a guaranteed income and why I joined mayors for a guaranteed income. And, um, it, you know, the I, there's, you know, we, it is, and I don't mean to say that it's not important, right, the policy details, but, um, but at the, the beginning and end of this for me is that we, the impacts of poverty in my community and across the country are so devastating to our communities and to our residents um, that we have to find some way to lift people up. Um, and to provide them with the income that they need. And, it, you know, whether we're talking about uh, a guaranteed income or a basic income or, you know, uh, frankly, 
any way we can get there, I'm interested. Um, and you know, that's what it comes down to for me is, is that you know, we really just need to be making a difference in our communities. Madeline? Absolutely. And I, I think I would tack one more distinction that's often made on is that universal basic income is often seen as providing a basic level that would cover all of your basic needs. So your housing, your health care, your food, your child care, whereas a guaranteed income might not provide for all of those base needs, but it's going to give you that bump. It's going to provide a bit of economic stability and resiliency in your life. Um, another distinction that we often see is that UBI can be seen as replacement for social safety net programs and guaranteed income is always thought of as supplemental too. Okay, and I'm going to come back to that point later. I want to ask about that later in the panel. But the first thing I want to actually ask um, both Mayor, Mayor Tubbs and Mayor Rose Conway is what are you doing in your cities? I know Stockton actually has a pilot program now. I know Madison is considering one. So what, what are you currently doing in Stockton and where are you in the process of this, of your program? So for the past 20 months in Stockton, we've been giving a group of families $500 a month for their, to illustrate the efficacy of a guaranteed income. And what we have found is that people spend money the way you and I spend money. So the money's not being spent at liquor stores or at ja in Jackson at the casino, it's being spent on basic necessities, on food, et cetera. And during COVID-19, it became incredibly clear that a guaranteed income was a lifeline for so many of our residents, particularly folks who are waiting two or three months for unemployment benefits, although they deserve them, although they paid into them, those aren't automatic. You have to wait. And your bills don't wait with that waiting period. Our folks who are told to shelter in place or stay home if they had a fever or a cough, but don't have paid time off. And they said, well, if it wasn't for a guaranteed income, I would have went to work and possibly infected other people because I didn't know if I had COVID and I needed to eat. So I think, so because of that, that's what led to the formation of Marriage for Guaranteed Income and realizing that in 1967, Dr. King looked out at civil unrest in the country and said the, the solution to racial justice has to be an economic one as well. And a guaranteed income makes sense. And I think in 2020, with COVID-19, with this great recession, and with the civil unrest because of racial injustice, now, if, if, if there ever was a time, now is the time for something like a guaranteed income. Okay, one quick follow-up question. Um, how are the families selected for this? Yeah, so we have a brilliant team of researchers. Um, who designed a, a, a mechanism um, after listening to the community who understood that 125 people is not the same as 300,000 people in the city, but they wanted it to be as fair as possible, meaning that as many of the 300,000 people in the city could qualify. So they came up with selection criterion that you had to live in a census tract at or below the city's median, which is 75% of the city. And then from there, random newsletters, were, I mean, not newsletters, but where random mail pieces were sent out, inviting people to apply. And then the researchers did their research magic and created a control group and a design group that doesn't mirror the city perfectly, but does get to the diversity of the city in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of um, income. And for people who want to nerd out, you can go to StocktonDemonstration.org, and there's an amazing 16-page white paper that by folks who are smarter than me put together that explains some of the selections and things of that sort to, to, to get a, a cohort that's balanced and gives us some interesting insights. Okay, and one, la one last question is, and people are on, receive the income the entire time, even if they like have a sudden jump in earnings, they still get it? Or do, do you have some point where they would tap out and you would say, well, you know, you're doing too well and you need to move on? No, and I think that's what the beauty of this is, is right. that we want to show that this policy particularly impacts those in poverty. It makes a world of difference. But even for people who are making sixty, seventy thousand dollars given the California housing market. Right. Even given people who have all these students, like it, it's, a, it's a solution that works not for them, but for all of us. So there's people in the program who make more than 70K. And there's people in the program who make less than 40K. And I've been fascinated with how each and every one of them talk about how they're doing good, how the money is necessary, how the money is needed, and how mm -hmm. it's allowing them to actually um, live with more dignity. Okay. Um, and Mayor Rhodes Conway, what are, what are, I know Madison is just at the beginning of this process. So tell me where you are and what the sort of things you're thinking are at this point. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it, my journey here really started watching what Mayor Tubbs was doing in Stockton and, and, you know, reading about this really innovative program uh, because, you know, I had, had thought that, that some sort of, you know, UBI or a guaranteed income was really, 
just out of reach at the city level. Um, and, um, you know, but Mayor Tubbs didn't take no for an answer, um, which I really appreciate. And, and so I've been watching with a lot of interest what's happening in, in Stockton. And, um, and when um, Mayors for a Guaranteed Income reached out and invited me to, to be a part of the organization, um, I was absolutely ready to jump on board and to find out more about how we can make this happen, not just in Madison, but all across the country. And um, so where we're at in Madison is that we are putting together um, putting together our framework for how we think about this. And, and we're likely to start with a task force that will engage the community. Um, one of the key questions here, so there's, there's a, a bunch of questions and, and um, you know, Madeline and, and Mayor Tubbs are much deeper into this than I am, but the questions for Madison are, um, how are we going to focus a pilot? Right, and where is the funding for that pilot going to come from? And so we we are likely going to need to raise the funds uh, privately. Um, it's not feasible, I think, for us to to run a pilot with um, city dollars. Um, so that's one piece of work that that we need to embark on. And then the other question for us is, I think, how do we want to design a pilot program? So certainly Stockton offers one example, but um, I've been interested in the other examples that are you know, more targeted to a particular population, right? So there's some examples that where we're looking at um, new mothers um, as, you know, one target population, or, or maybe uh, we might look at folks that uh, are experiencing domestic violence. Um, or, you know, I mean, so I'm interested in, in both what my community feels like would be most effective here, but I'm also interested in um, what is most useful for us on a national level to learn about, right? Because the, the end goal here, I think, and I'm, I'm jumping the gun a little bit, right? But the end goal here is not uh, for each city to set up their own program, mm -hmm. right? I, I think the end goal is for us to prove, right? Cities are the laboratories of democracy, right? We need to prove that this works. Right. So that we can get it adopted um, at the state and hopefully at the federal level. Um, to be much more comprehensive. And so M Madison is, is interested in, in helping the broader picture here. And so if there is a way that we can target our pilot to gain more information for the whole country, I think we'd certainly take that into account. Okay. And Madeline, you, know, you have more of a, a broad overview because you're dealing with um, all of the cities that are doing this, I think. I mean, how many cities are doing this now and how big are the projects? So I am very uh, thrilled to be partnering with Mayor Tubbs and the other 24 mayors that are officially on Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. It's growing every day. Um, so there are pilots around the country that are mayoral led and non-mayoral led. So Mayors for a Guaranteed Income is really providing a hub for technical assistance and that coordination that Mayor Rhodes-Conway was talking about to build out the research, to really demonstrate, as Mayor Tubbs said, that this is a solution that works for everyone. Uh, so we're all working together there. Then there are some projects that are, again, not mayoral led that are being run looking at, um, there was one recently announced in San Francisco at Expecting a New Moms. There have been some, uh, there's one in Jackson, Mississippi that's in its second cycle focused on black moms living in subsidized housing. So there are uh, programs around the country really demonstrating how cash is a universal solution to very different problems, to very different communities and to very different uh, needs. Okay. And um, is there one in particular that you would like to discuss for one minute that would be different, it would be very different say from the Stockton program? And what sure. are you seeing from it? Sure. So the one that I think we have the most data and information from is the Mother Magnolia Mothers Trust down in Jackson, Mississippi. I, I feel like I'm preempting the mayor. Um, so this is in his city. It's Springboard to Opportunities is the nonprofit that runs it there. The first year, it was 20 single Black moms in subsidized housing who received $1,000 a month uh, for a year. This, it's on its second cycle, which launched in March, just before we started to learn the scope of the pandemic. And it was 70 moms. It's been expanded to 100 moms. Um, it's very different than the Stockton demonstration in 
a couple key ways. I was just on a call with Suki, who is uh, the director of the Stockton program, as well as the director of Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, really talking about the benefits cliff issue and all the work that was done in Stockton, recognizing that as these families are getting a little extra money, they might lose access to some of the social safety net programs that they had. And so a lot of work was put in to um, get waivers and mediate between that, recognizing that that $500 a month could go right out the door if we're not also protecting the other benefits that these families and individuals were eligible for. Stockton, uh, sorry, Jackson has, took a different tract and they recognized they weren't going to be able to get the waivers down in Mississippi and um, working with the, the various programs. So they gave more money. It's a thousand dollars, but each of the moms sees roughly 600 because they lose 400 in benefits. And so it highlights kind of that benefits cliff, that, that thing that so many families are confronted with. Do I take a job that gives me a slightly higher salary, but actually at the end of the day, I'm going to see less on my family's dinner table because I'm going to lose other benefits I'm eligible for. Um, so it highlights that problem. It also highlights the way in which currently the earned income tax credit works, where it excludes the lowest earners from eligibility for the most money, for that most refund at the, the end of the year, which just really doesn't make sense when we think about what it's trying to do and to support our families. So this actually in Jackson would allow some of those moms to get that, that maximum benefit that they previously hadn't been able to earn. Um, so the first year of data is, is out. They're also running um, more information and trying to tell these stories and the narrative around what it means to trust black moms when so much of our uh, policy making and decision making has been through a lens of gendered racism, particularly when we talk about benefits and think about benefits. So to elevate black mothers as those who know best for their families, themselves and their communities, I think is very important. Okay, and have people dropped out of the program over the benefits cliff issue? In Stockton Mayor, as well? Or Mayor both? Tubbs, do you want to speak to that? Or again, I just got off this call with Suki, so have it handy if you'd like Go to. Go ahead. Uh, so, you know, again, they did amazing work to navigate that issue and to get waivers where possible. Um, there's a, a journal article I'll drop in the chat as well that the researchers and Suki wrote um, about that issue. But they did find that the two that they weren't able to get waivers or create a whole harmless fund for were. Um, uh, food stamps, uh, SNAP, but it's not a one-to-one -one loss. So people were generally prepared to go forward with the demonstration, recognizing that they would still have enough money to buy food and that it was more flexible, right? It wasn't that the limitations that you see on EBT. Um, the one in which folks were usually not able to move forward is if they were earning SSI and that they saw that that would be something that they couldn't afford to, to lose and to participate. Okay. What did you see in Stockton? Was it so that was Stockton, right? I mean, yeah, that, that, yeah that, that was Stockton. And, and yeah, I'm sorry about that. Well, it was interesting for some people, though, that even with the risk decided that, you know what, I need the cash because I sell right. some of my food stamps anyway because I need cash and I, and I do these other things anyway. So that, I, that was eye opening for me about how our current benefit system serves a useful purpose. But it's not a panacea and it's not perfect. And that a guarantee income has to be part of an extension of that. So that folks right. had the flexibility because every month the need isn't food. Every right. month the need isn't just housing. That needs change because incomes are so volatile. And it sounds like from what you were saying, in some ways it gave people a choice of how to handle it themselves versus just getting this block and you have to use it for X and this block and you have to use it for Y. Yeah, the biggest thing for me has been is eye-opening in terms of this idea of agency and trust. Mm -hmm. and who we give agency and trust to and right. also this humbling as a government official to understand i could be smart and well read but there's no way i can know for 300,000 people each and every month what the best use of money is for them because incomes are so volatile and that was a perspective i didn't realize until i was talking to people and every person had a different reason why 500 dollars this month would mean something for them and i was like oh my gosh there's no way anyone could design a program that gets to all these things what would they say? What would, what would... Yeah, one lady told me that she, the $500 would come more in handy in the summer. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. do you take a lot of trips? And she said, no, my kids come back from school. And my bills go up, my food goes up, my income doesn't go up. And it stresses me out actually when they come, but I don't tell them that because I want them to feel comfortable coming home. 
Mm -hmm. uh, one person told me how the $500 this month will be more useful for our transmission because our transmission blew out this month. And she's like the 50% of Americans that didn't have a $500 saved for an emergency. Or just like little, very intricate things. Like, oh, I'll be able to give more to my church this month to help with this program. Or I'll be able to help this person. Or I'm able to help my kid when they move into college. And it was just fascinating to realize that there's so many ways in which people use money. And that money is really a proxy for time for the ability right. to have the time and flexibility to do what's necessary um, to be human. Right, so that it made people's lives easier. And did you, were, did you study, I mean, the, you know, the, and, or in other programs besides Stockton, Ma Madeline, you know, the sort of mental health effects of having this extra money? And what did you see? Yeah, so we have, oh, go ahead, Madeline. No, go for it, Mayor Todd. Okay. No, it's hard to talk, so please go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking you, you missed one of the opportunities we can spend money for on is dental care, right? Because right. somehow our eyes and our teeth are not part of our health care. Um, so yes, uh, in Stockton, they are specifically looking at mental health issues um, at hope and mattering, which are skills that determine does someone uh, feel like they want to get up in the morning? Is there a reason to do that? Do they matter to the community? Can they, can they be seen as somebody that other folks rely on? A lot of the earlier studies, the 60s and 70s income maintenance experiments were really focused on the impact on the labor market. Um, but folks went back later and dug through that data to try to figure out what they could find. And they found you know, a reduction in emergency room usage, the, uh, an increase in birth weights, um, particularly when there had been a lack of nutrition in a community. So there are these um, ripple out effects that maybe aren't what we initially think of. I think there's a lot of concern around, oh, if you give folks 500 bucks, they're gonna kick back and not join the labor market because where in this country can you live on $500 a month? <laughs> but we know that's not true. That's been proven over and over. There, there might be a slight dip of uh, three to five hours of engagement with the labor market, but it's it's young folks, so people stay in school longer, and it's new moms who maybe wanted and weren't then able to stay home and care for their kids and recover themselves. So um, the labor market dip is not something we have to be concerned about. It's been disproven. We have data from Alaska, the you know generation or the 30 years of the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend showing us that the, again, some um, decrease in folks entering the labor market young and a slight decrease for uh, people who have young children at home, but otherwise no implications on the labor market. But there are positive in implications on higher birth weight, lower childhood ob obesity, um, more family togetherness, you know, just really all the things that we want. And we saw that in, in Stockton and we saw that in Jackson where uh, the moms are able to cook more meals at home. They have less stress. They, they talk about being hopeful for what the next five years is going to bring them. And that has huge implications on their mental health and their children's mental health. There's actually a study being run right now, um, Babies First Years, that looks at giving prenatal and postnatal moms a guaranteed income. What does that do for kids' brain development? Because we know what stress does. And so if we can take a little of that stress off, can we really support these kids at the most important moments in their lives? Are you seeing any results, any f findings from that yet, or is it not there? It, it's not completed yet, but okay. there have been positive early results. Okay, and, and are you I'll seeing? Definitely... Okay, are you seeing any at the other end of the job market with older people? Are you seeing any earlier retirements or less people in their late sixties less likely to work, or is or is just the income? Is the experiments not going up that far up the um, to that age group at this point? The pilot programs, I mean, blah. As far as I know, there hasn't been one that targeted um, mm -hmm. elderly workers or, or folks entering that time. Right. Um, but I think that's one of the great things about Mayors for a Guaranteed Income is again, each city can recognize the need in its in its city and target that, right? So we have cities that say gentrification. We got to make sure that our communities can stay put. We've got to target the housing mm -hmm. crisis. We know that there are, you know, moms who need benefits. We have an aging population and we have to ensure that transition is smooth. Each city is going to be able to target their demonstration, should they run one, to the needs of the community. And I think that there are some really brilliant minds saying, okay, well, what about this? How can we support this community? How does cash solve this problem? And how, 
No, go I ahead. You go ahead, Mayor. I, yeah, I just want to jump in because I think that that one of the things that that is we're seeing in terms of you know how people use the money and and the importance and the need is the the COVID nineteen pandemic has really just laid bare for us how fragile people's financial states are, right? And and mm -hmm. how many different things people have needs for. Um, and, you know, the, the most obvious is the sort of immediate medical care, you know, if you do get COVID, right? Or if you get sick and you don't want to take the chance of infecting, as Mayor Tubb said, your, your coworkers and, you know, or um, parents that are sending their kids to school in places that there is in-person learning, you know, even though they might be sick. And, you know, I just think that there's so many ways in which this pandemic has really laid bare the whole range of financial needs that households have. Um, and, you know, and we could, what, what historically our approach has been, okay, well, we'll, we'll try and figure out the, the financial need for food, right? And how do we get people food, right? And right. then, you know, okay, well then we'll, we recognize that people have a problem with housing, right? And so we'll figure out the, these elaborate programs, right, to get people housing and to help people afford housing. And, you know, and the city of Madison spends millions of dollars on this, right? Or, you know, or we need to get people a higher income. So we'll, you know, we have these elaborate training programs to, to connect people to jobs and, and to get them. And, it, it, but, we've built up this like this massive structure of trying to help people just have more cash right? right and so why not just let people have more cash right it, it, to save us the trouble of building up these giant structures and managing them uh, and also as mayor tubb said to trust people that they know what their biggest needs are and that if they do have more cash they're going to use it to make their lives better um, and, you know, I'm not saying that all of our programming around food or housing or whatever is going to go away right away, but I, I am saying that, that, you know, I cannot tell you the number of times during this pandemic where I have thought, well, gosh, if people just made a little bit more money, mm -hmm. this would be easier. Right. Are you, um, how are, how do you see, you know, the current crisis um, impacting the programs? I know that in, in Stockton, you were supposed to, um, is it in Madison, are you considering it more and is it there more support because of the current crisis? And in Stockton, my question would be, if I'm remembering right, weren't, it wasn't the program supposed to wrap up and now you've decided to continue it? And whoever wants to go first can go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it is definitely um, seen as more feasible. Um, mm -hmm. um, and certainly my interest is is heightened because of the pandemic um, and the, you know, just the struggles that we're going through um, to figure out how to support families um, in this time. And, and, you know, and frankly, the frustration um, with trying to figure out, you know, like, okay, so we get a little tiny bit more with CDBG and we get a little tiny bit more under ESG and we get a little, you know, but we weren't one of the communities that got CARES Act funding directly. And so, you know, just it, it's, it's been really frustrating to try and, and bring some relief to our community. And so, yeah, I, I think it definitely does make it more interesting. And, and also, I think, again, really highlights the problem in a way um, that maybe makes it more politically palatable for my community to consider this. Okay. Mayor Tubbs? Yeah, I think the COVID-19 crisis really illustrated um, the even added importance and urgency around something like this. I think we started the pilot in Stockton because we recognized that poverty is in and of itself, in my opinion, a pandemic, a crisis, and, and right. something that demands urgent attention. And COVID-19 just exacerbated that. And we felt it was be incredibly inhumane for our folks <laughs> during this time to kick them off um, the program, knowing that more so than ever, it was necessary and needed. So we're lucky enough to find a partner in Carol Tolman to extend the program through January. And then also that's where Bears from Guaranteed Income comes from. Um, before a lot of mayors have been interested in, 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 in wanting to see their final evaluation results that won't be out till next year. But COVID-19 made it clear that the status quo is untenable, that today people are working as essential workers and have to stand in line in food banks for food, that today people are working and putting their health and their family's health on the line and still can't pay rent, that, that, that before COVID-19, one in two Americans can afford 
one five hundred dollar emergency, and we know that number is worse now. And then with the federal government and even some Republican legislators talking about the need to give cash to people, it created a moment. And then after the George Floyd murder, it just became very clear that structurally something in this country has to change. That the status quo, this, the population, our citizens are, are, are demanding that we do something that's commensurate with sort of the times that we're in. So that's why we decided to extend the pilot in Stockton and also to support sort of other mayors and other cities, understanding that pilots are one thing, but we want policy. We want guaranteed income to be a policy. We want it, whether it's through the earned income tax credit, whether it's through cat, however we get there, we want to make sure that as many of our constituents as possible have an income floor so we don't have the extreme um, discrepancies in income and wealth. So we don't have um, some people paying $750 in taxes while proclaiming to be billionaires and some people paying more than that but can't afford $750 in rent, right? So, so that's sort of the, the, the moment we're in and COVID-19 gave it the added urgency. Right. I, do not get me started on the $750 in taxes. <laughs> I figured out last night that if Trump went to the restaurant at the, at the bottom of his building at 1 Central Park West, he couldn't pay for a dinner for three with that money. So, um, but... I, I paid more when I was a <laughs> high school student working at Barnes & Noble, and I'm, right. so, I'm really upset. <laughs> I think I did, too. And I, I think we had the same job, actually. <laughs> and... Um, the, the question is, is, you know, do you think, you know, I think we could all agree there's been, you know, an uptick of interest and support in the current environment. Do you think it will last past the current environment? I think we all know in the United States, we have this tendency, and, and, and I think this is why UBI became such a thing for a while, that we really like universal programs, right? We like, that's why Social Security is traditionally the third rail of American politics. Everybody, or just about everybody, gets Social Security. Medicare, the same thing. After that, it sort of becomes welfare. We demonize it. We think people who are getting it are a bunch of slackers who don't want to work, or you know, or you know, there's racist terminology starts creeping in. I don't think I need to tell anybody that. And so, are you worried at all that you will see a sort of drop off in support as this period passes at all? Um, I, I I do and I don't, and, and I don't because just given the economic impacts of COVID-19, those aren't going away, even when there is a, a federal strategy for containing this virus. Mm -hmm. um, the impacts will be long and prolonged, particularly for small business owners, essential workers, et, et cetera. And we know that before COVID-19, we were in an economic crisis for a lot of working people in this country. And we know that afterwards it will, it will be worse. And there has to be some sort of recovery mm -hmm. plan um a and then i think number two what's interesting is that this sort of calamity is something that's widespread and sh it's disproportionately impacted by some groups but it's shared everywhere in every part of the country whether you're a red state or a blue state folks economic insecurity is becoming so much a part of what it means to be an american citizen um in in, in 2020 so so i think the pandemic gives our federal government the cover to start but without it, the problems are only going to get worse. It's only going to become more urgent because we're not even talking about even kind of displacement and automation um, right. that's supposed to happen as well within the next decade. So there has, and I, and, I, and I look back at sort of the New Deal in 1935 when a lot of these programs are universal and, and so beloved happened. And when they happened, they were radical programs that people called them socialists. People said this is not American, not a sacrosanct. And I think of it's ridiculous to me that in 2020, our primary response to COVID-19 has been unemployment insurance, which was radical in 1935, but this is 2020. <laughs> like, we have to really update our safety net w with the time. So long answer to say, um, I think myself and the other mayors will make sure that this is part of the agenda and how do we provide economic security for our constituents in a crisis and outside of a crisis, because we're always going to be in some sort of crisis in somewhere in this country because of climate change and things of that sort. Okay. Mayor Rhodes Conway, you were going to say something. I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. And the only thing that I would add is that um, as long as we are helping the people who need it most, I don't have any objection to a, a guaranteed income program at the federal level looking more like a basic income program. Like if the federal government wants to spend more money to help more people, that's fine, right? As, as long as we make sure 
that we are taking care of the people that need it most. Okay. Do you, um, do you think that, um, you know, as this period goes on, I mean, you know, I, I think Mayor Tubbs is right. I think this is going to go on for a very long time. Are you worried at all that, you know, people, you know, again, traditionally in the United States, at some point we start blaming people for where they are, right? You know, all of a sudden, wait, it's your, you should overcome automation. And in fact, we're seeing, we have reason to believe there is an uptick in automation now as, you know, people are using, you know, trying to avoid cashiers at the supermarket, say, and they're going to the self-checkout line all of a sudden. Um, are, again, are you worried that, you know, there will be less support for this because, you know, people will be seen as just not dealing, you know, with, you know, re-educating themselves, right? Like, that's always a good one. Or conversely, do you think the support will build because it will become more clear that we will need it, you know, as people are, you know, forced to say, relocate because of climate change. Um, like Mayor Tubbs, I'm, I'm actually in New York right now, but I've actually been in California most a good chunk of the year. And uh, there's a lot of movement right now of people getting pushed out. I mean, is, is this going to become a bigger part of the conversation? I, I, honestly, I, I don't see how as a society and as a country, we continue, frankly, mm -hmm. without something like this. And not to be an alarmist, but we're talking about widespread economic deprivation. Mm -hmm. um, each and every day, we're seeing evidence that, and not, not hating on Jeff Bezos, he had a brilliant idea, and I'm so happy for him. But I am very scared for a country that allows him to amass so much wealth during a pandemic when his workers, the people that create the wealth, are saying, we can't pay for health care, right? Like, so, I, and, and it's not, and, and before it was like a niche thing, like, like poverty, but Again, one in two Americans are one paycheck away from, from the food okay. bank and, and, and from the bread lines. And as this crisis continues, we're going to see more and more and more when it become an overwhelmingly major, uh, overwhelming majority of the American public who are saddled with student debt or, or medical bills or scrupulous home loans. And, 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 and so there, there's going to have to be some sort of response because it's not just an, an issue that's going to impact those people or black people or even just poor people they may be the most disproportionately impacted but a lot of even looking in my inbox now i have emails from small business owners who are very self-reliant right. who are very proud of being independent who didn't need no help from government who wanted no regulations tubs stay out my way who are saying mayor tubs what are you going to do i can't make payroll this month mayor tubs i'm laying people off and those stories are becoming sadly widely shared American stories. I think that level of widespread hardship in a functional democracy, at least, would have to necessitate some sort of policy response, some sort of recognition of the pain, and some sort of um, solution that, that, that gets to sort of where, where people are. Madeline, have you seen a difference in how people approach all this as this crisis has gone on? or a shift in attitudes, or is it mostly the same to you? No, actually. So we had worked with um, a researcher out of Stanford who found an increase in support for universal basic income. That was the terminology that was used. And it was uh, described as $1,000 a month to everyone or almost everyone. And then the increase was from I think about 55% had been the max she had seen historically up to 69 to 75% support in the first few months of the pandemic with the greatest growth from conservative women. Um, so this is not traditionally where we expect to see this support. Uh, so that was really interesting. Now, complicating it apparently is when we talk about race that that goes down um, among conservative women. So one of the things that we're doing at ESP and that we're partnering with folks to do is really challenge those underlying beliefs and really put race front and center in this and the way that guaranteed income has been historically with Martin Luther King, with the National Welfare Rights Organizers, uh, with the Black Panthers calling for it, recognizing how important it is. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done around narrative change, right? This idea of deservedness of what it means to, to be American, to have a, a floor, right? I, I mean, I think it's very hard for, for folks uh, to that have come through two once in a lifetime economic <laughs> recessions 
in their working lifetime to say, why do you think this works? Why this last 40 years, this, this experiment you've been running on us, like this isn't working. And it's, you know, it's the same fight that we're seeing for, uh, you know, Medicare for all, for jobs guarantee, that people are saying we can and should do better, that we expect more from our government than to leave us out there in a pandemic with, with no money to put food on the table. Um, so I think I, I do see what you're saying, you know, this universal programs tend to get more support. Uh, great, let's do it, but let's tax it back and then let's make sure that the tax system is actually working and you're not getting $750, right? Um, so there's a lot that we can do and I think that, that folks are gonna demand it as, as they should. That this is the richest country in the world and the richest time in the world and this is what we're, we're expecting, that's not enough. Okay, um, I see Mayor Lumumba just joined us. So um, before I ask you a question, I just wanna to say to our, our audience, I'm gonna start taking audience questions at about 15 minutes or so. So if you wanna start submitting questions in the Q&A, that would be terrific. Um, Mayor Lumumba, thank you for joining. Um, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about your, um, um, well, I know it's um, a sponsored program, but the sponsored program in, in Jackson and, and where, when did it begin? Who is being, who is taking part in it and what are kind of results are you seeing at this point? Absolutely. Uh, well, first and foremost, thank you for having me. Please forgive uh, my tardiness to the panel. Uh, I was in the midst of a, of a council meeting uh, and, you know, uh, the mayor's certainly know how that, that can drag on and, and how, what could take place there. So uh, we were dealing with that. Um, and, and I'm happy to be a part of this very important discussion. Uh, my first, um, uh, the first time that I was made aware of the Universal Basic Income Initiative, I believe that I, I saw a write-up of uh, my dear friend, Michael Tubbs, uh, uh, and I felt that he was trying to be the most radical mayor and, and I, I didn't want him to, to get the jump on me. Uh, and, and so I think this was before I, I actually met him and, and since then, you know, we've discussed a number of issues. Uh, but I made uh, my administration aware that I wanted to know who was funding it and, and I was very interested in seeing it happen in the city of Jackson. Uh, to my surprise, uh, I learned that Aisha Iandoro um, and the Magnolia uh, trust uh, mothers were were doing a pilot, uh, and that was done based on uh, the data, uh, based on seeing that that not only uh, do we have a high rate of poverty, uh, and and I believe um, I believe that Gandhi had it right when he said poverty is the greatest form of violence uh, that you can inflict, uh, and it has so many ancillary effects, uh, but most especially we were seeing it around a population. Uh, that their financial strength and well-being is not only uh, important to them as individuals, uh, but often being the centerpiece or, or the, the, um, the true uh, fabric that holds together family. Mm -hmm. uh, we were seeing it around uh, single mothers. And so uh, that pilot has demonstrated uh, what our, I think we have hypothesized, uh, that by giving people uh, the very basics of what they need, uh, that, that not only it creates stability, um, and you find that you, you learn a lot um, that, that steers away from the narrative uh, that is often portrayed. People say things like, uh, you know, people uh, don't want to work, uh, that, that people uh, just, just want to uh, take advantage of, of government. Um, and, and so what we have found is that it has empowered people to explore many of the goals and aspirations that they have already, uh, have, they have already set for themselves. Uh, and I think just basically we have to understand that people are not only fighting for access to capital, uh, they're fighting for access to live. And, and so uh, we've done everything I think I think I heard Tubb say this uh, at another engagement, we've done everything for poor people except give them money, right? Uh, and, and so we have to understand uh, that we have to create economies that are centered around human dignity. And that is what our focus is in Jackson. 
uh, that we've seen these cycles of humiliation that communities are facing time and time again. Uh, and, and we have to look at the success of our economy more than just on the basis of GDP, on the basis of the economic development that we see going on, whether there are great edifices being created in our communities, and look at sustainable development goals, uh, whether people have access to uh, safe and, and affordable housing, adequate and affordable housing, whether they have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, whether they live in safe communities, uh, whether their infrastructure supports their needs. And all of these things are really byproducts of poverty. They're byproducts of a community that doesn't have the very basics of what it needs in order to sustain their lives uh, and, and to see the quality of life that they so justly deserve. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, question um, for everybody. I mean, th this came, this has come up briefly as we all keep talking is, you know, there are people who say they would prefer to see a job guarantee than, you know, see, a, you know, a basic income guarantee. Why not a job guarantee? Or do you see it as potentially complementary at some point? I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. I think they solve for different things um, because part of the power of a guaranteed income is that there's a lot of people for a variety of reasons who make the choice not to work. I think of caregivers and, and, and people, mostly women, who decide that they want to stay home with their children and they should be compensated and paid for that work. Because I know two days a week I spend on, on Zoom with my son is the hardest work of, of the week, more so than even these crazy council meetings. Um, and we also know there's folks with disabilities who aren't able to work, who, who still deserve some the ability to pay for the basic necessities of, of, of being human. And, and we also know that, that a, a job guarantee is also an important tool because it, it provides leverage for people to have more agency in making employment decisions. It, it has the impact or it could have the impact of causing employers to sort of raise on wages or provide more protections, particularly if they have to compete with the government for those. So I think those solutions are complementary. I don't think they're um, mutually exclusive at all, but I do want to say a job guarantee does not make for a more feminist economy. I still feel women who do caregiving and domestic work still won't be compensated for the labor they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ma Mayor Rhodes, is this coming up as, as an issue as you're you know, navigating this in Madison? You know, it, it hasn't really, um, but I, I think the, the point that Mayor Tubbs makes is, a, is an important one, that there are a lot of potential solutions in this space, and they're not mutually exclusive, right? So in the same way that a, a guaranteed income and a jobs guarantee are not mutually exclusive, and, and as the mayor said, solve for different problems, I, I would argue that, you know, for example, a higher minimum wage is not mutually exclusive with a guaranteed income, right? That there, that we should be doing both. Um, and that, yes, they do solve for different problems. And, you know, in the same way that, that um, you know, building back our safety net um, is not mutually exclusive with a guaranteed income, right? So it, it's, it, you know, and I, um, Marilyn Mumbai, it, what, what you say about a people-centered economy is, is really, that's really right, right? That, that we should be using all of the tools at our disposal um, to figure out how to have a, an economy that is more centered on human beings um, and meeting their needs. And so guaranteed income is one of those tools, uh, but there are many others and, and guaranteed income alone, as excited as I am about, you know, getting started here in Madison and watching what's going on in all of the other cities, it, it's not the only thing that, that we'll do and it's not the only thing that we'll work on, right? It's, it's one of many and, um, and I think it is, you know, I, I certainly hope, I don't know, I have, I have increasing doubts these days, but I certainly hope the federal government can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? And could do a guaranteed income um, while also providing health insurance for everybody. Right or while also, uh, you know, raising the minimum wage. Uh, I mean, these things it, it, you would think uh, would be straightforward, um, but uh, and certainly, I, you know, if if you are a mayor, I think you have a, a different perspective, uh, maybe from some of the folks in D.C. on how important these things are, because we're really on the front lines right. of this, and I think that's why you see this group of mayors um, that are pushing these issues and and. Um, you know, really pushing the federal government to take more action. Mayor Lum Lumumba? Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I concur 
uh, with the, the statements preceding me. Uh, first and foremost, it's not the panacea, mm -hmm. uh, but it allows us to take on a comprehensive view of how we address things like uh, generational poverty uh, and, and all of the things that, that flow from that. Um, and, and so I think that we also have to consider in that discussion about, uh, you know, just seeing a guaranteed job as a solution, uh, some of the trade-offs that people are making. Um, if there has been no time in history that should highlight uh, the disparities that people are having to make uh, uh, based on those trade-offs, it would be now during COVID-19. Uh, we're seeing uh, the breakdown of education because uh, children are having to go virtually, uh, not being fully supported. Uh, they don't have the, you know, there are households that, that forget the fact that they don't have the privilege of either computer or internet. Uh, they don't have the privilege of staying home uh, with their children uh, so that they can help them. I have a six-year-old daughter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I just so happen to be in a place of privilege uh, that we can adjust our schedules. Uh, nobody's going to fire me if I bring my daughter to City Hall, right? Uh, some people... Uh, are having to make decisions because they still need to put food on the table uh, for their families, uh, that they have to leave their children in what honestly is a vulnerable state, right? Even the older children that are within our school systems. Uh, we're seeing uh, that, that, you know, with uh, more time to get into things uh, and less uh, instruction from a guardian or, or someone, uh, uh, a mature, adult, uh, that, that there are all kinds of things that we see escalate within our communities. And so uh, we also have to consider the trade-offs when we look at, you know, a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, what do we, what are you seeing, and, and I, I would start with Madeline here, is, you know, uh, there's all sorts of different programs, and, and right now you're getting different sums of money. How does the different sums of money impact things? Does a really small amount really make that much of a difference? Conversely, is there a point where it could be too much money or, you know, and I don't mean necessarily for the person themselves, but does it trigger resentment at some point of, oh, well, she's getting money, but I'm not. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there, we've been pitched against each other, right? right. And that, that's how this economy has maintained such disparity because there isn't class consciousness and cohesion recognizing, well, we'll all do better if we all do better. And that requires some folks to maybe do a tiny bit less well. Um, but I, I think, so I, as far as the amount of money, I mean, as most of these programs historically have been philanthropically funded, there's been a push pull between how much you can give and how many people you can include. So um, that's been kind of a limiting factor to date. I think that, you know, we have new research showing how many folks would be lifted out of poverty if there had been an extra stimulus check, right? And so mm -hmm. that's huge. We can go from, so it's about 4 million folks are lifted out of poverty because of unemployment and SNAP. The one stimulus check lifted got us up to eight, and the two gets us up to 14 million people lifted out of poverty that's not that much money. It's $2,400 could keep 18 million folks from slipping into poverty. Um, so I, I don't know that we have a top number as, as to what is, you know, when, when does that balance shift and it becomes something problematic where there's resentment. But I think we have to tackle that anyway. We have to talk about the ways in which helping everybody have an income floor is actually good for everyone. Um, and I think that, you know, Mayor Tubbs has done a great job in Stockton because again, it was 125 folks out of a city of 300, at more than 300,000. So most people didn't get it, but the city itself supports it. So I think that there's a lesson to be learned there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, did, what, did, what did you see in, in Stockton with this Mayor Tubbs? In terms of the politics of resentment? Yeah, were there any? I mean, maybe there were. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, most people that were mad were mad because they didn't get the money, right? <laughs> and they, but it was interesting how they couched their anger because it was coated with all type of racial innuendos. So they would say things like Mayor Tubbs only gave it to his family and friends, meaning black people, mm -hmm. or, or Mayor Tubbs only gave it to South Stockton, meaning black people. 
despite the fact that Stockton is actually overwhelmingly not black. Um, it's incredibly diverse, but mostly white and Latino. I um, mean, in fact, 47% of all the people in the Stockton pilot are white. So like the, the single largest group of people receiving this benefit in the city of Stockton are my white brothers and sisters. Um, so, so it was interesting trying to navigate that and helping to educate the community, but I, I kind of get How some did you do that? I don't mean to cut you off. How did you educate the community? Yeah, it's been a lot of conversations like this one and being very clear that no, for we can be happy for these 125 people because although they may not be you, they are reflective of your experience. So let's be happy for other people. And, and the reason we're doing this is so that one day we get a policy that helps everyone. But in the absence, and, I, and I, this is kind of my governing frame, we can't do everything, but that's not an excuse to do nothing. And because we can't help everybody, doesn't mean we shouldn't help nobody. And that's kind of just how I try to govern all the time because resources are always a, a, a limiting factor. And I think part of it has also been being very, very clear and letting people know that even though you're not a recipient, I see your pain. Like, no, I, I get it. Like $500 would help you. I believe you are deserving of $500 too. And if I had it, you would have it. <laughs> but in the absence of that, let's be happy for these 125 of our neighbors who are receiving it and let's work together to make it a policy. And that works with some people, but some people are still mad. Uh, are, you say, are, you, are you navigating this as you're trying to set this up in Madison? Um, Mayor Rhodes Conway? I think it's a little too early for us to be getting that pushback. I imagine it will come and I imagine that it will, you know, have the same contours as what Mayor Tubbs is describing. But I, I do think um, in addition to, to the responses that, that Mayor Tubbs um, suggests is it, that, you know, we really do need to articulate how even though the the cash might go to a, a small group of people, the benefits go to the whole community. How right? so? And, well, so you think about if somebody is able to stay home when they're sick instead of going to work, that's a benefit, particularly right now, that's a benefit to the whole community. If somebody is able to stay home and support their kids in virtual learning, that's a tremendous long-term benefit to our community, right? If somebody is able to not use the emergency room because they were able to afford health insurance, that is saving thousands, tens of thousands of dollars uh, for our whole community and strengthening our healthcare system. You know, if somebody is able um, to, you know, access good, healthy food in a way that they weren't able to before for their family, right, then their family is, you know, not straining the healthcare system, not necessarily uh, straining the benefit system, growing up healthier, you know, I mean, there's just all sorts of long-term benefits Right. And there's, I think, a substantial evidence base around how if we can move people out of poverty, right, the entire community benefits from that, even if you're not directly engaged with those families. And so, you know, to me, it's, it, I mean, yes, obviously, there's a sort of direct, like, well, why did this person get a check and I didn't get a check? But, um, but really what we're doing is investing in community. Right. What we're really doing is investing in the health of, of neighborhoods. Um, and this is just one way to do that. Um, and the benefits really do accrue to the entire community in the long term. Okay. Um, I'm going to start turning to some of the questions, even though I have tons more questions myself. But um, what a lot of people sort of focused in on is, you know, both how to expand this more broadly and how to pay for it, um, which is always the question, right? So, you know, one person asked, um, and I think this was a really good question, actually, it's the first one that came in, is they noticed everybody here is Democrats, um, and they pointed out, is, um, are we getting, are you getting any support from the National Democratic Party for this or the Biden-Harris campaign? And what kind of, it, what kind of contacts have you had, if any, with the national apparatus and the Biden-Harris campaign over, you know, to, um, ex, you know, do guaranteed incomes or universal basic income? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I know um, VP Biden just came out, I think last week, with the child, um, child allowance plan, which isn't for everyone, but it's a guaranteed mm -hmm. income for people with children. Um, in terms of a group, we know that definitely needed during this time. We also know that Senator Harris, while a senator, came out with the LIFT Act, which was using the earned income tax credit to provide $500 a month to families 
in this country making 100 k or less. And she also has a bill right now in the Senate with Senator Sanders and Senator Markey, which speaks to a COVID guaranteed income of $2,000 a month for families making $125,000 or less, lasting up to three months before and after um, this pandemic. Um, so we know that the administration is working hard um, in, in terms of ensuring that they're elected. And I think once elected, there'll be a real conversation about the best way to have a response, a national response to COVID-19, which part of it has to be an economic one. Okay. And I will thoughts? say that, that I have been lobbying the current administration um, on a guaranteed income. I'm not sure that it's making any difference, uh, but you know, this you are is a heroic woman. <laughs> well, you know, um, it, you know, we have our list of things uh, and, and we, you know, we, we have elevated guaranteed income onto the list of things that we are consistently asking the federal government to support. And, uh, you know, whether that's the White House or our delegation, um, I think it's important to be educating and raising awareness around this um, and for them to understand that, yes, you know, we are doing what we can here, uh, but we need them. Uh, to step up and uh, and to take care of folks in our community and all across this country. And so, um, you know, whoever is in charge, uh, I'm going to be saying this uh, because it will continue to be true that we need support and help in our communities. In, in full agreement with uh, Mayor Rhodes, uh, you know, as we try to push the present administration, we know we, we have to continue uh, to make uh, the needs of the people clear. Uh, but, you know, in the borrowing words from Professor Ruha Benjamin, uh, we must not only dismantle uh, the world we don't want to live in, we have to be the most active participants in building the one we do. Uh, and so that means that, you know, even as we try to oust uh, one administration, it doesn't mean that we let uh, one that, that may be more uh, ideologically aligned uh, with us off the hook. Uh, we have to continue to, to make that clear. And, and as we talk about what we can afford, I think Madeline alluded to this earlier or spoke directly to it. You know, we operate from a place of scarcity when we actually live in a world of abundance. Uh, you know, uh, at the time of, during COVID, uh, you know, things that people have been arguing about for a long time, uh, the need to have access to health care, uh, the resources people need, uh, when, the, the, the moment necessitated it. Uh, we saw that it was less about an ability and more about political will uh, in order to make things happen. Um, and so I think that it's, it's important that the narrative supports that. Um, and, and, you know, this speaks to the previous question, I believe as well. Uh, often what we find is that people aren't really afraid of change. Uh, people are afraid of loss. Uh, and the more that the narrative points to how they're losing in the equation, how they may not be getting something, uh, the more that they are in opposition to it. And so we should frame the discussion about uh, the way Mayor Rhodes said about how this is our collective gain, how it helps support the, the, the fabric of the community, the foundation of community uh, in ways that makes us all safer, uh, in ways that builds the economy for all of us, um, you know, <laughs> We're talking about understanding the basic needs of people. Uh, we nothing illustrated that more than the need that that you know everybody in this country or just about I, honestly some people didn't actually if they didn't file taxes but but no not many people were were turning away their stimulus checks right uh, they saw the need and it made sense to them because they were struggling because they could not figure out how they were going to take care of their family in this moment and if we can understand that in this moment then how are we incapable of understanding that with people who suffer from those conditions in and out of a pandemic? Okay, um, another question that, by the way, I just wanna say all the questions are fantastic. So if I don't get to yours, it's nothing personal here. These are really, really great questions. Um, and the no, and I don't say that at every panel I moderate. Um, do, um, is there any role for the private sector in here in either lobbying for this, in trying to make this happen? Um, has anybody here reached out to the private sector at any point in this? Um, mayors, who wants to start? Or Madeline, do you want to start? Uh, I would say 
you know, one of the ways in which guaranteed income came back to the forefront recently was through this idea of the tech apocalypse and the robots coming for our jobs. And it was um, the private sector or folks from it were calling for a UBI. And some folks saw that as a way of abdicating their responsibility to pay fair wages and to not fracture the workplace. Um, I think that, you know, to tie it back to the last question, there are different ways that we can support and pay for this, some of which are regressive, like a value added tax, and some of which are progressive, like a wealth tax and an inheritance tax and raising the top marginal tax rate and ensuring corporations pay their fair share. Um, so I think I'm skirting the question and I'm not fully answering it, uh, but I know that there are folks in the private sector who, who support a guaranteed income because they recognize uh, that there should be an income floor and there are ways in which um, all of our voices need to be tied together, but I, I'm not sure necessarily that there has been a huge push from the private sector to, to do this. This is really coming from a groundswell uh, from the grassroots and then the leadership of the mayors that you see here and others like them. Mayors, do you, do you know anything different or is this about what your understanding as well? I, I think we need to see support from the private and public sector. I, I think that's what it's all about. Uh, you know, and, and ultimately, once again, it's about the narrative that, that demonstrates the value added for them. Uh, you know, I have in, uh, an energy uh, company here in the city, uh, well, in, in the state that, that, you know, is invested in economic development. The reason that they're invested in economic development, while that isn't the direct product that they, they sell, is that they realize the benefits of economic development means more clientele, more, more energy dollars for them. Uh, the more we can support uh, people's basic needs, uh, the more consumers there are in the market that can, that can purchase the things that they need, uh, the, the more we deal with the generational poverty uh, and, and elevate, elevate you know, uh, the average household income and, and, and you know, benefits at large of the community. And so sometimes uh, it's difficult for people to see the correlation when it's, you know, one or two steps removed. Uh, but I think that this is why this panel is so important. I think the coalition is so important is because we're bringing to the forefront uh, considerations that have not historically uh, been, been, um, been made. Speaking of coalitions, another question. What would it take to get Republicans, whose mantra is being fiscally conservative, to buy into such a necessary program? Does anybody have any thoughts on this that they want to share? Vote them out of office if they don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> no. Putting my C3 hat on. Um, we did see Republican support. We, Republicans were calling for stimulus checks. So there are there is an understanding, uh, it was focused on the pandemic, that this is what people needed. I think the, you know, the deficit question goes out the window when their party's in charge, so don't bring it back when you're not. Um, and I, I cut you off, Mayor. I'm sorry, but I just, yeah. No, 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 that's fine. I, 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 I'm actually going to ask if, if Mayor Tubbs, I, I, I heard him give an analysis that I can't quite recall. Um, uh, at, a, at a panel discussion, I think it, with the National League of Cities, uh, when somebody challenged him and he listed, you know, some some uh, Republican leadership over over time that had done, you know, similar measures of of uh, of, of uh, social economic uh, movement, and, and so I don't know if you remember what I'm talking about, Mayor Tubbs. Yeah, yeah, I think I talked about how. Um, the socialist Sarah Palin increased the amount of the Alaskan Permanent Fund, um, which is a guaranteed sort of income program for Alaskans, I guess, just for living in Alaska, um, based off the oil revenues. And she was so popular um, as governor because she increased it. And so this is a good thing to give my people money. Or the fact that um, Richard Nixon, the super liberal president, Richard Nixon, um, was doing your earn in, negative earned income tax experiments and trying to figure out sort of how do you get cash to people and what the impacts are. Um, and that, those experiments were actually run by Donald Rumsfeld in, in, in about 40 years ago. So, 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 I, so I think part of the strategy has to be not talking to necessarily the lawmakers, but talking to their constituents 
and talking to their pocketbooks and talking to how this is a good thing for them, how this is additive. This is not rooted in loss or because you need help or because you don't, you're not good enough, but it's because as a community, we are good enough that we can afford to do this. And this is something that's actually in line with our values and what we purport to be on, on paper. I think that's part of it. And, but then I think an, an, another part of, of the strategy is, is understanding again, and I, I find this to be factual, feel free to disagree, but we're talking about a party whose interest is in hoarding and stratifying wealth and income, whose interest is not in having economic security, who profits um, or their donors profit from the poverty we see in terms of predatory lending, in terms of check cashing places, in terms of private prisons and private detention facilities, in terms of defense contracts and the carceral state. So, so I wouldn't expect um, the Republican Party to, to embrace um, such policies, but I would expect their constituents to understand how $500 a month would help them. And I think we are given an added advantage because we're in a real kind of New Deal moment. And I think particularly for those of us who have steady jobs whose paychecks aren't affected by kind of global disruptions, it's really hard to, to really um, ascertain just how dire the situation is for the vast majority of people in this country, that we are literally in the throngs or walking into a Great Depression. And that moment's going to necessitate bold action. I think the people are going to call for it. If people aren't going to sit around and be hungry and in food banks and not able to work and shelter in place, not be able to open the restaurants for, for too long without saying, well, what the hell do I have a government for? And, 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 and what's, what's being done? Yeah. If I I'm, think that-, that Mayor getting, Rhodes. Getting back to the, 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 the difference, right, between the, the party, right, and folks that might just have a more conservative um, outlook on life is, is an important uh, distinction, right? Because it, I think what you say, Mayor Tubbs, about appealing to constituencies are, is is really important and and so I would argue that right that a basic income or a guaranteed income is crime prevention right I would argue that a guaranteed income is a, a small business support mm -hmm. right um, that it is a way to support entrepreneurs right that it is a way to allow people to start their own businesses it's a way to support farmers right it's a way to support our agricultural economy it's a, i mean this is this is not a program uh, if you if you really imagine it at a, at the federal level across the entire country this is not a program that's that helps 100 people in a city here or 200 people in a city there right it it um, as fully at the federal level, um, you know, would be helping folks all across this country, um, you know, make a difference in their communities and do things with their lives that they have dreamt about doing. Um, and it, it really is, I mean, it, it, I think you could, uh, I, you know, Mayor Tubbs, I don't want to, you know, step out ahead of you too much here, but, but this is a program that's about freedom, right? This is a program about people having the freedom to do what they need to do with their lives and having the economic security to do it. And it, it's, it's not honestly that much money. Um, and so I, I really do think that this is something that, um, that ought to be appealing to folks from all bands in the political spectrum. Is there, has there been, there's a couple of questions along these lines, so I'm gonna to try to mesh this all together. But people are asking, has there been a way to try to expand this onto the state level, or is that even financially um, possible because states do need to balance their budgets and therefore would it need to be federal? Um, and I'm not sure who wants to start with this, but is there any statewide in any place? Madeline, maybe? Yeah, so the way in which uh, we at the Economic Security Project have really seen that movement is with the modernization and expansion of the earned income tax credit. So what we've been working with states and at the federal level to do to modernize it would be to make it automatic filing or that, you know, folks get notice that they're eligible because so many people don't even know that they're eligible for it. 
to have monthly payments instead of a lump sum to help smooth out some of that economic insecurity that families can face throughout the year. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to cover those unpaid workers that Mayor Tubbs was talking about, so unpaid caregivers and family caregivers, low-income students who, you know, really could use earned income tax credit to help them stay in school so they can get to that next better paying job. Um, so these are some of the ways in which city uh, states have been expanding and creating more space and more, um, you know, more income for folks. We know that the earned income tax credit has some flaws um, in that there, you know, zero dollar earners are excluded. So if we can expand it to include unpaid caregivers, low income students, move it down the age group and up the age group, we can do more to bring more folks in and ensure that the, the biggest benefit gets to everyone. Um, I do think though that when we think about a guaranteed income, we are thinking about a federal program. Um, you know, Alaska has one, so there is a state that runs one through the Alaska Permanent Fund. The expansions to the earned income tax credit are necessary, vital, and we're going to keep fighting for them next year. Um, but we also are really pushing for this federal pipeline to create a, a federal guaranteed income. And this is one of the really important ways in which the mayors can advocate for that together. Their voices are so powerful. And then bringing it all together, as they said, these are, you know, this is where democracy is tested. Big ideas are born. They are closest to the problems, closest to the solutions, closest to their constituents. Somebody was trying to speak at some point. Was it Mayor Rhodes Conway or was it somebody else? Or? No, I, I think that was me. Okay. Uh, and, and I was just going to say, I, I certainly hope that, that we, uh, as we, as we uh, advocate uh, for this to be a, a widely uh, embraced program, uh, that we think of the state's component. Uh, I'm still waiting on on healthcare expansion in Mississippi, so uh, <laughs> I, I would hope that we we either uh, incorporate state support or or an avenue that we could bypass states um, in Mississippi. Uh, you know, but I, I think that we go back to uh, understanding uh, the ecosystem of of how this 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 works and 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 improves or repairs what what's missing. Uh, and, and once again, you know, the narrative about how this is for collective gain. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Rhodes Conway was, was speaking about how this is crime prevention, and it truly is. Uh, and an inability for states or the federal government to see that means that we become overly reliant and dependent on, on economies uh, that, that ultimately are not, uh, are not productive to our overall well-being as a nation. Uh, when we when we see this take place, we start relying on things like, you know, uh, an overutilization of our criminal justice system, right? Uh, which leads to another thing that that we haven't talked about since I've been on the phone, uh, and that's the social justice movement that we're seeing, uh, where you have uh, communities that that are you know being terrorized uh, by really what in some ways is really a reflection of the economic policy that we have as a nation. Um, if you look at it, if crime stopped tomorrow, our economy would fail. Uh, and I'm not talking about the underground economy. I'm talking about the people that we know that rely on crime taking place, whether that is the lawyers, right? Uh, whether that is the, just, the judges, uh, whether that is, uh, you know, more law enforcement that we see today than we've ever seen in the history of the world. You have city police, county police, state police, federal police, secret police, secret police, we watch the secret police, uh, probation and parole officers, prison uh, guards, companies that, that contract with the prisons. And all of that relies on an over-incarceration of our society, which necessitates a conflict taking place within communities. And so if we, we look, you know, it may be, it may appear somewhat removed from the initial question, but when we look at the issue of, of you know, financial well-being within our communities, it is very much uh, aligned with, with these other social ills that we are realizing today. Okay. Um, do you think that, um, actually, I'm going to take us back. Um, we've like three minutes before I have to wrap this up. This has been such a great conversation. So I want to ask, wanted to ask everybody before this ends, where would you like to see this discussion in five years? Where do you think it will be? Where do you hope it will be? Um, what obstacles do you think you will have overcome or what obstacles do you think will have appeared? Um, whoever wants to start. 
I want to see the discussion over. I want it to be done. I want it to be discussed like Social Security and Medicare. It's like, this is what we need and this is who we are as Americans. It's part of the contract and what took us so long to get here. Yeah, I was going to say that I, I want Madeline to be writing a, a you know, a study based on the rollout of the national program in five years, right? That, that we're, that we have, um, you know, gotten the federal government to take this seriously um, and that we're in the phase of, of studying and tweaking and um, understanding the impacts um, across the country. Okay. Uh, the same. I, I want to see Madeline unemployed in this regard. <laughs> um, <laughs> But but we you would have a, a, a I would have a basic a, income so yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm putting it on my to do list yeah but but no I, I I would hope that we're on to the next uh, thing and and uh, in the words of Obama you know there's nothing more patriotic than the 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 concept that America's not yet done and so we would move to the to the next thing what is the next thing uh, well I, I I'm you know an advocate for uh, universal health care coverage. Uh, in fact, we're trying to model uh, what we want to see uh, here in Jackson. We just made a decision in our most recent budget that we're covering 100% of the health care premiums of our city employees. Uh, you know, that could not be more timely in, in a moment of COVID. Uh, but that is another means of financial uh, insecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think we have to look at that. Madeline? I think if we're, we're on to the next thing, I mean, maybe we all have a little bit of breathing room. So our next thing is reading a book or taking a walk or painting a picture or spending time with my kid, right? So I don't know, maybe in five years, we all, everybody has a little bit more stability and we are thinking not what's the next fight, but what's the next pause? What's the break we all deserve? Okay. Um, I have tons more questions and so does the audience, but I think I'm getting what the British would call the uh, hurry up, please. It's time message here. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to Katie for um, a final um, wrap up, but I want to thank everybody for being a terrific audience. And I want to thank my amazing and wonderful panelists for um, putting up with my questions and putting up with all our questions and just being so forthcoming with their answers. Katie? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, Helene, for doing such a fantastic job moderating this conversation. This is really a very, very fun um, and hopeful um, conversation. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, just thrilled. And thank you again to our panelists um, uh, for your wisdom and for bringing us into um, the work that you're doing. Um, I do want to point folks um, at Mayors for AGI.org is a, a great place to kind of follow and see um, what's happening at the, the mayoral level in terms of um, a guaranteed income and um, the fight. And um, I, I, I did really love the uh, five years from now, I hope that we're able to pause and we're not just moving on to the next fight. So, um, but yeah, uh, um, check out the work that's happening there and to see um, if your mayor is is on the list. They're adding um, more and more mayors are are signing up and saying, hey, I want to find um, find out if this could work for our city. Um, uh, to our audience um, participants, um, look out for a follow-up email in the next week, which will contain a link to the recording. Um, uh, yeah, so that'll be coming your way. Um, you can also take a look uh, to see upcoming events from NCRC. Go to ncrc.org slash events. Um, and if you're not yet a current NCRC member, um, you can also go to NCRC's website to join or renew online at ncrc.org slash membership. Members get free access to these Just Economy sessions, discounted tickets to the 2021 Just Economy Conference, and access to data and custom research as well as updates and opportunities to engage in our policy and advocacy work as we work together to create a just economy. Um, so thank you all once again um, and look forward to continuing to work you, with you guys towards a just economy. <laughs>